the uh, white room area. Everything is in readiness there. In this is a site that's becoming more and more familiar. Even so, it's an event that many people like to share. The place is NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Roads and surrounding waterways become viewing positions from which to witness the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia. These scenes were recorded just before the last mission, Space Shuttle 3. Coming up next, the fourth and final test flight before the shuttle becomes the operational spacecraft it was designed to be. Before looking ahead to Flight 4, here's a look back at Flight 3. Some different types of space travelers were taken to the launch pad ahead of the crew, including flies, honeybees, and moths. 18-year-old Todd Nelson, a winner in NASA's student involvement program, suggested and helped prepare an experiment to see how insects react to the zero gravity of space. What we'd like to do is obtain additional information on the survivability of the worker bee and the velvet bean moth and a fly. And to do that, the chamber is designed, you know, to house the insects for a period of less than one hour for direct observation by the astronauts. We are go for main engine ignition. Eight, seven, six. Five, we have main engine ignition. Zero. Zero. At 11 a.m. on March 22nd, Astronauts Jack Lausma and Gordon Fullerton headed for space. Columbia orbited the Earth 129 times during eight days and traveled almost four million miles. The crew accomplished nearly everything they set out to do. This included alternately pointing the spaceship's nose and then the tail to the sun for critical thermal tests. The orbital maneuvering engines were started and restarted. A long remote arm was used extensively easily moving a scientific package both outside and inside the payload bay. A materials processing experiment involved the development of uniform-sized latex spheres. These spheres are used in a variety of earthly medical applications. The crew also gathered large amounts of space science data using a special pallet loaded with scientific instruments and called OSS-1. There were experiments to monitor X-rays coming from solar flares. Photographs show that one side of the space shuttle actually glows at night and creates a wake like a ship in water as it travels through the thin, electrically charged gases of space. Several times, Lausma and Fullerton could be seen working with their insect passengers. While the honeybees seemed a little disoriented, the moths and flies appeared to be right at home. As you can see, the crew had some fun with this one. After heavy rains drenched the primary landing site in the Mojave Desert, it was decided to land Columbia at the Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. As the crew prepared entry into the atmosphere on March 29th, wind velocities rose sharply at White Sands, and they were waved off. The next morning, at 11.05 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 30th, Jack Lausma eased Columbia onto the gypsum runway under blue skies and acceptable wind conditions. Six days later, Columbia left White Sands and returned to the Kennedy Space Center to be ready for the fourth flight. One of the first jobs was to repair and replace protective tiles that were either lost or damaged during the previous space trip. The planned seven-day mission should complete the shakedown of the shuttle, making the space transportation system operational beginning with the next flight. It will also carry the first Department of Defense payload. Astronaut Ken Mattingly, 46, was born in Chicago and will be commander for Space Shuttle 4. He has already spent more than 265 hours in space during the Apollo 16 mission to the moon. One of the major scientific packages in the payload bay will be the Induced Environment Contamination Monitor, developed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Ken Mattingly explains. And it's a fairly uh, straightforward but uh, fairly elegant package of instrumentation that we use to measure the environment around the spacecraft, pressures, particulates. Uh, you can 
can measure temperatures, you can measure all kinds of things. They, they take gas samples. It's just an amazing array of, of things, instruments, and, and collection devices to help us understand what the environment is around the spacecraft. People that want to fly payloads and experiments on the orbiter need to know what does the orbiter do to space because we carry our own little atmosphere with us. When we boil water to, for cooling, why well, you put some water vapor out there. And uh, the engines fire and they leave residuals around the spacecraft. And it's important to us to understand how much of this stuff stays in a little cloud around the spacecraft and how much dissipates and how rapidly those events take place. And so that's what this little package is doing for us. Another Marshall experiment will require the crew to record lightning as it occurs over the Earth. What you're discovering is the interactions between the oceans and the atmosphere, and you really find that both of them are really the same thing, except that one's more solid than the other. And you watch this interaction, that creates a lot of clouds and a lot of convective activity, and we call those thunderstorms. Uh, the people working this experiment are trying to record data on how thunderstorms build, spread, how the electrical discharges operate the physics of the problem. Once they understand that, they'll be able to make a much clearer interpretation of weather environments and what's likely to happen in the future. So this is the first step of uh, taking a look at something that could really expand our knowledge of how the atmosphere models work and give us a great deal of power in predicting what's going to happen to ourselves in days to come. 48-year-old Henry Hartsfield from Birmingham, Alabama will be piloting from the right seat of Columbia on the fourth flight. Hartsfield described the multi-dispersed latex reactor, or MLR, that will be tested again during Shuttle 4, a device that makes latex spheres. Now these are very small, minute size particles of latex, and the, when we say monodispersed, we mean essentially they're all the same size. And in the laboratory, we can build these things only up to a very small size to two or three microns, and then gravity starts to distort and uh, destroy the process in which the, we grow these particles. We would hope to be able to grow them to a size in zero G, an order of magnitude larger than what we could uh, grow, grow them on the Earth. Now, on flight three, they flew this experiment and uh, grew some latex balls, all of about the same size. In fact, it's remarkable how closely in size they are when you look at the the photographs made with a high-powered microscope. And we got them larger than we'd ever been able to make on Earth. And we're taking these particles as seed particles on Flight 4 and starting with that size and going to grow them even bigger. They have a great potential for medical research and also medical treatment in that these particles, because they can be controlled in their size, can be sized to match some of the membranes and tissues in the body. A new pharmaceutical processor will also be tested on the shuttle this time. Now this is a very exciting experiment. Uh, I think it's going to have a, a great impact on us all eventually down the line. The, the basic premise of this experiment are, is to separate biological materials using uh, electric fields. Now this is done on Earth in 1G and in the laboratory, but we're severely handicapped by gravity itself because gravity disrupts the process and makes the yields very low. Uh, in the microgravity or zero gravity of space, we should be able to increase the yield several hundred times over what we can get on Earth. Now, there are a number of materials that you could separate this way uh, that would have a great impact on medicine. People that are afflicted with certain diseases that need certain hormones or certain types of materials to cure, which now can only be produced in very small, minuscule quantities in a laboratory environment, could be produced in space in larger quantities, and uh, reduce the price of these uh, medicines or materials to a large extent. If it works, they're already booked on several later flights, and this could very well lead to a factory in space that would be uh, making these materials on a continual basis. The first joint endeavor agreement was signed between NASA and the McDonnell Douglas Company in 1980 to help advance this technology and bring it to the public as rapidly as possible. What it means is that industry is beginning to put money, front-end money, in to do 
technology and research on new applications. And because the purpose and aim of NASA is to get technology developed into the public as rapidly as possible, by getting industry involved early, the incentives on industry to carry this technology forward are greatly enhanced because the only way we will ever recoup the money that we have begun to put in this program starting in 1977 is to physically get this technology commercialized. This empty canister designed to hold getaway specials was flown on Columbia's third mission. Astronaut Dr. Mary Cleed explains what the so-called getaway specials are. Getaway specials are uh, this sounds bad. Glorified garbage pan, can, cans. They really are. They're about the size of a garbage can, five cubic feet, and or else you can also buy 2.5 cubic feet. And uh, actually, if you stay within safety standards of NASA, um, you can do whatever you want to with that space. Uh, you could fly uh, up to 200 pounds, or for one cost, or else you know they have another cost for under 100 pounds. What it is, it's an, an attempt by NASA, I see it as an attempt by NASA to open up space to everybody. And that's an option that people really haven't had before because $10,000 or $5,000, um, let's say, is within the realm of someone who has an idea. The getaway special can that will be flying on for the one from Utah State University will be the first user can being flown. So this will be the first actually user bought and only user bought can on for. Gas is um, flown on a space available basis though so you, you know you get a good deal but you're taking up empty empty space in a cargo is sort of like buying you know space in a moving van where you're going to move when a van's going and you sort of have to be real flexible about your timing that way encouraging young people in grades 9 through 12 to study science and technology is the objective of a joint project between NASA and the National Science Teachers Association Students submit proposed experiments to be carried aloft on the space shuttle. Todd Nelson's insect experiment was flown on shuttle three, and two students have been selected for the next okay. flight. Their industry sponsors are the McDonnell Douglas Corporation and the Explorers Club of New York, respectively. Serving as consultant for the two young people is the chief of the biomedical laboratories branch at the Johnson Space Center, Dr. Carolyn Huntoon. Well, the two students that I'm working with um Carla Hosberger from uh, North Carolina has proposed an experiment looking at uh, basic mechanisms and uh, glucose control. Uh, we had noted in our Skylab flights that there were slight changes in glucose uh, levels of fasting glucose. So uh, she put in her experiment to look uh, at those glucose levels again as well as uh, uh, keeping a close contact on the diet uh, a lot of information on the dietary intake the astronauts are going to have, and looking at chromium, which is considered uh, by most people to be a factor in glucose metabolism. The other experiment is uh, Amy Kusky from uh, California, and Amy's experiment is looking at uh, lipoprotein levels uh, in the blood as they might be affected by exercise and diet uh, with spaceflight. So the two experiments, although they're looking at different aspects, they're both biochemically oriented, which is why I'm working with both of them. Uh, they're both oriented toward uh, the uh, astronaut and their health care, and our laboratory is responsible for that function here at the center. 16-year-old Amy Kusky, a high school sophomore from Long Beach, California, described how she expects the crew to carry out her experiment. During the flight, the crew will be asked to keep an accurate record of any exercise activity that they are performing and also they'll be asked to keep an accurate log of the diet they consume. Space Shuttle 4, the final orbital flight test before this country's space transportation system becomes fully operational. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.